Elementary music teacher friend, you love what you do, but you might feel unappreciated and, in fact, unseen some days. You may even feel like you're on a music teacher island and just want to connect with other music teachers who can relate to both your struggles and wins when it comes to teaching elementary music. I get you and understand completely the feelings you're having. That's why each and every week, the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast will provide you with solo and guest episodes that will help you realize you're not alone in your music teaching journey. Throughout each episode, my goal is for you to be able to walk away with actionable steps and ideas to help you feel like you're ready to take on the new week with whatever challenges may be thrown your way. Hi, I'm your host, Jessica Peresta, and I'm so glad you're here. Whether you're at home, in your car, in the shower, or wherever else you're listening, grab your cup of coffee or whatever other beverage is nearby and listen in to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. Hello, I am so excited to have you back today for a new episode of the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. Today's episode is teaching music in low-income schools. This is something I would say is probably one of the biggest passions of mine. One of the things I love to help give advice and strategies around because this is my experience. And in this episode, I'm going to mix it with a little bit of my experience and what I've found to be true with working in a low income school, and also with just some practical advice and tips. So I'm also going to share some podcast episodes that you can get even more support from that you can find on my podcast. And also, if you click on the show notes, you will see a blog post. So if you want to read and follow along, or you just want to have a blog post to read on your own time, then there is a blog post that goes right along with this episode in the show notes, or just head to my website, thedomesticmusician.com, click on blog, and it will be right there. So Um, Like I said, I'm going to be talking about a few things in this episode and sharing some podcast episodes that go right along with it. In the first podcast episode, I want to mention all the way back, oh my goodness, in episode two, wow, that was a long time ago, I did a podcast episode called Teaching Music in a Low-Income School. It is similar to this episode, but it's also different. So you'll get some different points in there than I'm presenting in this episode as well. This podcast episode came along for a couple different reasons. First of all, like I said, my experience, I had two conversations just this past week with two different music educators I am mentoring uh, in either in my membership site, one of them's in my membership site, the Harmony membership, and another one is a conversation I was having through the direct messages on Instagram. After talking with these teachers, I knew I needed to record a podcast episode and write a blog post about this topic because it is something that I get a lot of questions about um, when music educators know that this is my experience and they're just asking questions about how to effectively teach their students. I do want to also mention episode 148, which was last week's episode. If you have not had a chance to listen to that episode, it will definitely go hand in hand with what I'm talking about today as well, because I talked about how to make your music classroom inclusive for all students. So that directly ties into what I'm talking about today. No two schools are the same is the first thing I want to mention. I learned this from my experience when I did my student teaching in one of the richest areas of the Tulsa area. And this school, basically the music teacher there who did an amazing job, but basically she just would ask for anything and they would have funding for it. Then, so that was where my student teaching was, and the demographic of students were mostly white students. Then I taught my my teaching position was at a low-income school in one of the poorest areas in the Tulsa area, and the demographic of my students were mostly black students, and I did not have the experience where I could just ask for anything I needed for my music room and have it given to me. It just was not that way. And so what I was taught to do in college, then what I did as an intern just weren't effective when I taught music at this low income school. And I'm going to be explaining the reasons why throughout this episode. So please, as you're listening, remember, this is my story. Your story may be similar to mine, 
you may not have had this similar situation where you have not maybe taught in a low income school and maybe you are going to be teaching in a low income school soon. Maybe you have a new position and you're just kind of curious about what it's like. First of all, I do want to say it's amazing. <laughs> like 1000%, that is the only classroom environment I would like to teach in because I have such a heart and passion for it. So um, so that is what I want to say. If you ever have questions, just direct message me. Let me know if you have any questions about what I'm talking about today. Look for other teachers who are currently serving and teaching in low income schools and pick their brains about it. Ask them what they're doing. What's effective? What's working? What have you liked? What, what advice do you have for me? Don't ever stop asking questions as a teacher because I truly believe that you encouraging your students to always grow and have growth mindset and ask questions to learn, you need to have the same approach as a teacher. So let's start by talking about how funding is different. Funding, F-U-N-D, fund, funding. So I'll never forget, like I just kind of mentioned, walking into my classroom and I thought I would have the experience where, first of all, I would walk into a school that had instruments already there and here's the curriculum you're going to use and there's already, you know, desks or chairs or risers or whatever else set up and ready to go. And I quickly realized walking into this school, it didn't, not just that it had had music in seven years, but the fact that I had already, by talking to the classroom teachers, talking to, there was not an art teacher at my school, but talking to the PE teacher, talking to the librarian, and would kind of ask them, how did you get things that you needed? And they just kind of gave me these looks like, good luck. <laughs> I was like, what? So I really quickly realized while I saw my one broken hand drum, I had no chairs, no bulletin board resources or supplies, no teaching resources, no computers, or any other teaching materials for me to use. I asked my principal about getting what I needed, and she simply said, we don't have money for that. And, you know, pretty much just dropped the mic and walked away with, I'm standing there wide-eyed, like, well, what do I do then? Brand new, no idea what's going on, no idea how to get what I need for my classroom, had no idea this was even a situation that teachers walk into, because in college, I wasn't told that this would happen. It was just, here's what instruments you can use. Here's the songs you can teach. Here's the resources you probably have. Here's how you can seat your students. But nobody ever said, here's what happens if you don't have any of this. So I realized, all right, I got to get scrappy. And I kind of, I'm just going to be honest, I've always kind of had the personality where I'm very resilient, kind of a go-getter. And even if I don't know what to do right away, I am kind of a problem solver. So I kind of put those skills to work. And I realized there was no budget, no PTA funds, and I was pretty much on my own. So I honestly just started using some of my own money. Did not have a lot of money. Let's be honest. I was right out of college. I had been teaching private lessons at a, a local studio. I had about 20 to 25 piano students. I was also an, accomp an accompanist for two children's choirs in the area. So I literally just started setting money aside every paycheck to purchase things I needed for my classroom until I was able to get some help. <laughs> and so when you're brand new, you, you know, even if you apply for a grant or you figure out ways to get money and funding, it's not going to happen right away if you're brand new. So when I have teachers look at me like I'm crazy when I say this, but I, I say like, don't be afraid to use your own money because I'm not talking about for everything you need for your classroom. Of course, I'm not telling you to, you know, shell out $2,000 to get yourself some ORF instruments. But what's cool about using your own money is you keep the resources you buy. And so that is one advantage of it is if you do move to a new school or you move to a new state like I did, I was able to take all these teaching resources with me and some of the instruments I had purchased with my own money. So if you are in a low income school and maybe you had a student teaching experience like mine, where literally you witnessed your cooperating teacher asking for anything and kind of getting it, just literally filled out a purchase order and bam, what she needed appeared in her room. And maybe you thought that would be your experience in your classroom, or maybe you have taught in a school like that. And now you're in a low income school and you're seeing the differences. That's normal. And it's normal to kind of be a little bit shocked about it, about not having funding and not having resources given to you that you need and seeing teachers ask for different curriculum or resources and getting it. And you're sitting there like, what about me? I, I know it's hard to see that happening, but I do want to say to not compare yourself. Don't compare your teaching situation 
it, or the resources you have is what I'm trying to say to another teacher because that'll make you feel defeated instantly. Focus on what you can do. We're going to get into that a little bit later in this episode because you can do a lot. But there's exceptions to everything, of course. Some low-income schools will have funding set aside for teachers and others not so much. So you can't just say all low-income schools have no funding. I, Like I said earlier, I'm talking about my story and the funding that my school did not have. And, um, but yours may have some. So it, first of all, it doesn't hurt for you to ask. Just ask your principal, hey, do we have any money set aside that I can purchase some things from the music room? Or you know, talk to the PTA. When you do a fundraiser, is there something I can do or I do a fundraiser before my next concert or whatever it might be to get funding for your room? But don't be afraid to ask because there may be some money sitting aside or some grants you can apply for that you can get money. There's a lot of music education nonprofits out there now too that are giving money to schools. And in fact, in my membership site, my Harmony membership twice a year, we give back to schools or to music teachers who need funding for their classrooms because I know firsthand what it's like to need stuff and not have any idea where to turn to. So reach out to me if you are one of those teachers because as a membership site, we love to give back. So there's fundraisers, continue to ask PTA, um, give them specific details about what you're needing, not just, hey, do you have money for the music room? But I've noticed with PTA, or you may call it PTO where you live, if you go with specific ideas about what you're needing and an approximate amount of how much it would cost, a lot of times that will go better for you. There are grants to um, apply for. And also, when you start, if you're new, just start slowly getting to know the music teachers you work with. And then you can say, hey, can I borrow these instruments for this week? Can I borrow this teaching resources? And maybe you can um, borrow and share and trade and then trade back. But realize you're going to probably be spending a lot of your own money at first, and that's okay. And then you're going to slowly start seeing money, other places you can get money from. But right away, when you start at a low-income school, if you don't see funding right away, please know that that is normal. And it's not anything that's, it, it might be a shock to you, but it is just normal, okay? So let's move on. And so funding is the first thing I wanted to say about teaching and music in a low-income school that you might find that's a little bit different. But I also want to say what's important about teaching music in a low-income school, let's switch gears a little bit. And I want to talk about relationship building. Relationship building is so important, like so important. And in episode 61 of my podcast, by the way, this podcast you're listening to right now, I talk about how to build relationships with your students. So if you have not heard that episode, it's all the way back in episode 61. And so go back to listen to that after this episode. When you give, when I give advice to music educators who teach music in low income schools, I always bring it back to relationship building because building relationships with your students is probably the most important thing, in my opinion, that you can focus on. It will quickly steer the ship in the right direction. I will never forget (laughs) walking into this music classroom, hadn't had music seven years. The students didn't know me. They didn't know what a music class was. They didn't care what a music class was, just being honest, because it was so new. They just, it was unfamiliar. They just were unsure. It was, they were unsure about me. There had been a high turnover of teachers at the school. They didn't trust me. I, not right away, I was doing what I learned in college, remember? So I'm like, ooh, I'm going to start them singing. We're going to get moving. I don't have instruments, so we're going to do body percussion. I will never forget all these looks I got just looking at me like, you want us to sing? (laughs) Like they just don't, it was just so uncomfortable at first. I realized, all right, I need to kind of switch gears a little bit and build relationships with these students before I can even do anything else. They're not going to want to learn from me until they know me. They need to know who I am, not just as a person, but as a teacher. They need to learn to trust me and we need to build relationships. One of my favorite ways to encourage you to build relationships with your students is to learn their names. And not just learn their names, but how to pronounce them correctly. Instead of reading names down a list and just saying it incorrectly, if you get to a name you don't know how to pronounce, please look at that student. Or maybe you don't know who the student is, but please say, hey, who in here's name starts with the letter K? When they raise your hand, can you please tell me how to pronounce your name? That will go over so well with you. 
because it shows you care and you're making an effort to really know them and to know how to say their name correctly. And that really goes, it goes farther with students than you think it will. So please know their names and how to pronounce it correctly. Putting in the effort to really know your students and to build relationships with them will pay off for you in the long run. Maybe you won't see it right away. Maybe you're not going to see you know, instantly these relationships forming and relationship building happening, and then you're able to just do whatever you want in the music room. But I promise with consistency and effort, building relationships really goes a long way. It makes a difference and it matters. These kids need to know that you care about them and not just about, you know, helping them develop a love for music and teaching them singing and everything else that goes on in the music room, which by the way, all of that is so super important, but so is developing relationships relationships with your students. So that is what I want to first of all say. The next thing we're going to talk about is music teaching isn't a one size fits all approach. So when I taught music in my low income school, I realized quickly it was important to know students and to really understand the culture that my students were a part of. So although folk songs may work at another school, your students at a low income school might give you a deer in the headlights look the day you decide to try Alabama gal with them. Uh, That was firsthand experience for me. They didn't know who Alabama gal was. They didn't even know what the word gal meant. And they're looking at me like, you want us to dance down us, you know, down this line here and hold hands. That ain't happening. No way. So it took a while to just kind of figure out what to do and to realize that teaching music is not a one size fits all approach. What works at one school will not work at another school. What works with a certain set of students won't work with this other set of students. Why? Because everybody is Uh, different. Every school dynamic is different. The diversity of the students at your school is different, which goes right back to what I talked about in episode 148. When you find out what music your students enjoy listening to and what genres and styles of music are part of their world, i.e. hip-hop, pop, R&B, rap, country, um, every other genre of music there is, don't be afraid to create lessons around those songs. It's okay to bring popular music into your classroom. It's okay to develop lesson plans around what your students enjoy. There isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to teaching music. I feel like that needs to be stressed more. I know for me personally, I was not mentored and taught that and taught to about that. It was just, here's what you do with each grade level, go. Here's the different teaching methods you could teach with, but nobody told you how to figure out which one to use. And maybe you're stuck in that boat right now as you're listening to me and you're like, "Mm, that's kind of my situation. I know there are different teaching methods. I've been told that what objectives each grade level needs to learn and what songs I could do. But nobody tells you that you have to get to know your students. What do they want to learn? How do they best learn? That's where the magic honestly happens. When it comes to teaching music in low-income schools, students need you to find ways of teaching music that they can relate to. Not the way you think they should learn music, but the way that they can relate to. So episode 97 of the podcast, by the way, Culturally Relevant Teaching with Franklin Willis, he talks a lot about this. He talks a lot about how to make music education relevant to your students, where maybe you've been trying a certain way and it's not working very well. Go back and listen to that episode because it will truly, truly help you. There's also a bonus episode I did between episodes 102 and 103 about called White Music Teacher Do Better. And the reason I titled it that is because I taught mostly black students and I didn't, I wouldn't say I did a terrible job, but I also, what I'm talking about in this episode, once I started implementing the exact things I'm teaching you, this is when my music program took off. This is when the students started really enjoying music and music started changing their lives. And this is, I still get emails to this day from these kiddos. So go back and listen to that episode as well. The next thing I want to talk about is how students are dealing with a lot. Some of your students are dealing with so much behind the scenes that has nothing to do with what's going on in music class. It's easy to a lot of times take things personally as a music teacher and say, "Mm, they just don't like music class or they just don't connect with me. But there's sometimes there's stuff going on behind the scenes to accompany a certain behavior that you maybe don't know what's going on. Maybe you're not quite sure about why that behavior is there. 
But a lot of times there's stuff going on behind the scenes you may not know about. Episode 72 was about restorative behavior management with Elizabeth Caldwell. And she does a great job of talking about how to reach these students, maybe who you have a hard time reaching, have a hard time connecting with, and how what restorative behavior management is. So if you need that episode, it's episode 72, and it will truly help you with this exact thing I'm talking about today. Episode 86, Social Emotional Learning with Paige Bell. She talks about also how to reach your students on the social and emotional side of things and how you can really connect with them that way too. So go and listen to those episodes as well. So getting to know your students and the reason behind the behavior matters more than you can imagine. Knowing your students, what they may be dealing with in their home life, if a child is having to help get their sibling ready for school, if there was a drive-by shooting the night before, or if a child's parent is in jail, all of this matters. There's going to be a lot of other issues I didn't just mention there, but those are a few of the issues and the situations that I dealt with with my particular students. Once I started really knowing them, knowing different situations going on in their lives, it really helped open my eyes and soften my heart to some of the behaviors. I was seeing that was honestly just a byproduct of some certain things they were dealing with at home that were so tough. Instead of trying to shove a square peg into a round hole, you know, I'm thinking of those little toddler toys. Do you know what I'm talking about that have the different shapes on them and the little wooden hammer that you're hammering the shapes into the hole? Instead of trying to, you know, shove the wrong shape into the wrong size hole, And what I thought they should be learning by the particular objectives and the things I was told to teach, I decided to really focus on relationship building and loving on these students, which goes back to exactly what I was talking about earlier, right? A lot of my students needed a role model, a mentor, and an adult to care for them. Many students had teachers who only saw a bad kid, but didn't take the time to really understand why they might be struggling. If you're teaching music in a low-income school, don't give up. Just like you're taking the time to get to know your students and learn about how to best teach them, they're also learning about you as well and if they can trust you. Trust goes a long way with these students, especially when there may be a high turnover of teachers and they need to know that you're not just going to leave them when things get hard and you're going to stick it out for the long run. And the last thing I want to talk about today is how Teaching music in a low-income school and using what you have is important. We talked at the very beginning of this episode about how you may not have a lot, and you also may not get a lot of money to purchase what you need. But let me tell you something. You can teach music with not very much. And I've said this before, and I'm going to say it a lot. (laughs) Every student has a voice and a body. So guess what I did at first? We did a lot of singing and a lot of speaking and a lot of rapping. And we also used our bodies to create a lot of body percussion and do a lot of movement. The goal for me was to get the kids comfortable trusting me as a person, but also get comfortable in the music room. So how did we do that? I brought in music they enjoyed listening to. And sometimes we would just freestyle dance to it. There was no rhyme or reason. That wasn't even an objective to teach. And maybe it was only the last five minutes of class, but just letting them listen to things they enjoyed. We would do a lot of speech pieces and raps and we would break apart raps and talk about how the form of it was. Why were the, what was the verse? Why do you think they wrote the words first or put the beat behind it? And we would break down music that way. Then over time, I was slowly able to add in other stuff, other songs, other lessons, but start with where your students are. Start with what you have first. Start with getting to know them, the culture they come from, the community they live in. That is so important. You may not have many teaching resources. You probably have materials from college or old textbooks sitting around that you can start with though, right? That's my exact story. I spread out these old textbooks I found in the closets uh, in my classroom. It was a drama room like a long time before I got there. And then so these old music books were shoved in these closets under all these drama clothes that I found very deep, deep, deep down in these closets. And I brought them home. And I sat them on my living room floor and went through and said, okay, these are really old. (laughs) They're very old. And I don't want to just use textbooks with my students, but what can I pull from these books? I found some totally buried treasures in there that really were songs that would be effective to teach or I could adapt and modify to reach my students where they were at. So start with old textbooks maybe you have laying around. Maybe you do have materials from college that you can use, but maybe you can't, you don't, 
want to teach them the exact way you learn how to teach them, but you want to adapt it and modify it for how your students learn. There may not be many instruments around you, but your students can do body percussion and movement activities. All of the chairs may already be in the other classrooms, but you can get free carpet samples or sit spots for your students to use. As you see other music classrooms around you with smart boards or Chromebooks and you have nothing, it can leave you feeling discouraged, especially as technology integration is being emphasized more and more. And you're like, well, it's hard to integrate technology if I don't have any. But do you have at least one computer floating around the school that's not being used? Your students can share that. There's so much you can do with just one computer. And we can have future episodes about that as well. It's not about what you don't have, but what you do have. It's about flipping the script a little bit. And instead of the cup half empty, the cup half full, not, oh my gosh, I can't do this because I don't have this, 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 but you're like, "Mm -mm, I have myself, I have my students and I have my creativity. I have my teaching style. I have my personality. What can I do with my kids and get excited about it? They don't, they're not focusing on what the other schools have. They're focusing on just coming in and learning music and knowing you as their teacher. So focus on what you do have, what you don't have. Your students have you. You're there. You're not giving up and you're being consistent with them. They see that, music teacher friend. Do you hear me? They see that. They don't see the stuff they don't have in the music room. They see you teaching them music and being there for them as a mentor. Would all of the other stuff be nice? Of course it would. But is it something that causes you to be a better music teacher than someone else? No, it does not. Teach with what you have and don't let it hold you back from creating music with your students. Then slowly over time, you can add to your classroom. Of course you can, but don't let it hold you back what you don't have to teach with. Teach with what you have and keep moving forward. So I hope this episode was helpful. I hope you got some tips and strategies or even just encouragement and support as you listened in today. Please know I'm always here for you. I'm always supporting you. I'm always cheering you on behind the scenes. And I see you and I notice you and I I acknowledge you as the amazing person and the amazing music educator that you are. Well, hey there. Thank you so much for listening into the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. There is an exclusive Facebook group just for listeners of this podcast and any elementary music teacher called the Elementary Music Teacher Community Facebook Group. Come on over and join us there where we have conversations around the podcast episodes and encourage each other each and every week. And also head to my website, thedomesticmusician.com. I have some free resources there that you can download to help you gain traction in your classroom today as well as the blog and the membership site and all kinds of other goodies to help you keep going in your music teaching journey. I cannot wait to keep connecting with you and encouraging you and spurring you on in your journey of teaching elementary music. Hang in there, have an amazing week, and I will see you soon.